we can t make tapes of a coral reef and using AI and so forth, figure out who's there. from academicinfluence.com and I'm here with Professor Oshabel from Rockefeller University and uh, you study um, human environment so I wanted to ask you I mean I'm pretty sure every person my age has heard about climate change and heard about what we need to do to um, prevent the world from going to this place that everybody talks about uh, with climate change so I wanted to know what advice do you have for us young people um, in order to prevent uh, the effects that everybody's talking about with climate change? The, uh, I, I think there are th three ways, major ways to ad address climate change. Uh, and uh, the hard one is nuclear energy. Uh, people like to talk about solar and wind but the fact of the matter is solar and wind uh, are environmentally very destructive if, if we try to scale them up for seven, eight, nine, ten billion people. Uh, renewables may be renewable, but they are not green. They are made out of cement and concrete and cadmium. Batteries, of course, are made out of lithium and dreadful mines that operate in northern Argentina and southern Bolivia and northern Chile. Now there's an effort to open a lithium mine in Nevada. We'll see. You certainly could never open a lithium mine in Massachusetts or California. <laughs> so the problems of uh, renewables are going to become very obvious uh, over the next 10 to 20 years as people try to grow them. What does that mean? We can do something with renewables, but not a lot. That means nuclear energy on the supply side. So can we can we uh, uh, make nuclear energy that's uh, uh, acceptably safe and reliable uh, for different uh, cultures and societies? So the nuclear energy question is the number one question, I would say, climate. The number two question is how do we get from here to there 85% of the energy on the planet is still generated by coal and oil and gas. Coal is pretty oil, awful stuff, and I would say let's just get rid of it as fast as possible. Oil has wonderful attributes. It's compact and safe and doesn't explode and all kinds of things, but, but also it has well-known problems. Gas has some problems, but it has the least the fewest problems of the fossil fuels. So a big challenge for us is how can we burn methane, natural gas, as cleanly as possible for the next 30, 40, 50 years until we have alternatives? And I think there are ways to do that with so-called zero emission power plants where we separate the, car the, the one carbon atom from the four hydrogen atoms and bury the carbon again back where it came from. The third way to deal with climate change, of course, is adaptation. Uh, I think the single most important thing may be to improve weather forecasts because finally all climate becomes weather, whether it's a hurricane or a tornado or a flood or a drought. And if we really had good forecasts, not just let's say to five days that we have now for the weather, but if the weather forecasts really can get good out to seven, eight, 10, maybe 20 or 30 days, then the, the harmful consequences uh, for, for agriculture, for water resources, for human health could be greatly re reduced. So I'd say if you really want to make a technical contribution on, uh, uh, to climate change as a, as a scientist or engineer, I'd say, or it could be a lawyer or an economist, I'd say help make nuclear energy work, help make the transitional decades of natural gas as clean and safe as possible, and do the things that help adaptation uh, like uh, better weather forecasts. Of course, water resources law, things like that are also very important. How cities are designed, obviously the overall, the efficiency uh, of uh, buildings, you know, there's a whole set of, of ways that we could make the society less demanding of energy. That is so interesting. And I know that there's a lot of people my age who are really passionate about um, climate change and trying to reduce things like our carbon footprint. So what advice would you give them if they really want to go into something in this field? Uh, I, I know you mentioned that you were like one of the first people to really get a salary for um, doing things within climate change. So how do you think s somebody my age could end up making a career out of this? Oh, you know, 
you're asking uh, a question about uh, jobs and employment. First, I would say uh, the scientific enterprise in the U.S. and the rest of the world is is large. You know, hundreds of billions of dollars around the world do go for for research and monitoring in in biomedical sciences and earth sciences, all these all the different fields of science, and science has something very powerful, prestige. Now it has prestige because of the expert knowledge uh, and the analytic tools that uh, underlie it. But prestige is, uh, gives people influence in society, influence that's not proportionate, that's in a good sense, it's much greater than what's in your checking account. So I'd say training in sciences and engineering uh, is in fact a very good way if you want to have uh, influence because people will listen to you if you have something to say. So I'd say first technical training, which is hard, you know, you, my, you, uh, my grandmother say you need, you need sits flesh, that's flesh that can sit in a chair, you know, so, uh, you know, you know, I like field work. I love going to the Arctic or to right. uh, forests. But it, a lot of what uh, you know, a lot of what the training in science is is about patience and and waiting and learning things. Uh, so, but I'd say science offers a a great base because you can be influential. Then every field uh, can contribute to a knowledge of nature. So, the, the, you know the. You can be, you know, forests. You can be a forester. You you can you can be, you can, again you can you can be an expert on coral reefs. You can be a, an expert on the physics of the atmosphere. So so environment in that sense is a hybrid of all the fields, and that, that's really true for social sciences as well. Because uh, again, the the uh, there are, you could study economics, law, and even in the humanities, of course, in, in relation to environment, uh, much of the greatest art that's ever been created. Is uh, is art about nature? Uh, much of the greatest uh, uh, poetry, uh, you know, they're, they're amazing novels. So, uh, so you know, I don't limit it to science, but science has the advantage, the power of prestige. Wow, that is so interesting. And you were talking about how you created this catalog of marine life, and you develop or you discovered uh, thousands of new species in the ocean. How did you discover these? Was it actually going out and like doing the field work, scuba diving to find these, or how did you go about discovering all these new species? Sometimes it's just luck. Sometimes you may go somewhere looking for, not looking for something new, but it's there. But sometimes, but you can use you can use knowledge to identify areas that have been less explored. So, for example, the deeper parts of coral reefs. Uh, people have scuba dived a lot, let's say, in the top 200 feet of a, a reef. But if you go deeper than that, there's a lot still to be discovered. The very deep sea, of course, is still largely unexplored. Then there are also particular uh, species groups, taxonomic groups, that haven't been looked at much. So. Uh, the worms, for example, marine worms. You know, a lot of people, of course, like to study birds, all the the uh, uh, f fishes, the ichthyologists, or uh, the, the, uh, the there, you know, there are about ten thousand species of birds, and probably twenty thousand bird experts. Nice. But if you th if you ask about marine worms, there are tens of thousands. There are probably tens of thousands of marine worms, but only. You know, maybe ten people in the whole world who study them. So, if you become uh, a marine worm expert, you'll probably discover hundreds of new forms of life, and they're extremely beautiful, by the way, amazing. Uh, you know, and they make a living in incredible ways. Uh, so, so you you can bias the, your search in favor of success. Wow, that's so funny. So. Basically, we all should go into a um, marine worm um, discovery. <laughs> but there are probably still uh, two to four thousand more marine fishes waiting to be discovered. Wow. So you know the age of discovery is not over. My my own family has a lobster name for it. Uh, some colleagues of mine discovered a new lobster uh, near the Philippines in. Uh, uh, about a thousand meters, three thousand feet of water or so, uh, and uh, we were incredibly excited. My family were incredibly excited that it, our colleagues named it uh, uh, 
Ocebel's Mighty Claw Lobster, and of course, we made t-shirts and everything. <laughs> that is so cool to have a lobster named after you. Wow. And how do you go about counting all these uh, fish or lobsters or whatever it is? Because I, I can imagine you don't actually count them uh, one by one. Well, field work, uh, direct observational work, of course, in many ways is the most important, most exciting part of our work. It may only be one week out of 52, because if you go out and and listen and tape and photograph uh, everything, you get a lot of data, and then you need to go back to your to your lab or your office and analyze it. But of course, that going out into nature, whether it's in a desert or the rainforest or in the ocean, is incredibly exciting. And uh, science funding agencies, as well as private individuals, wealthy individuals, do fund expeditions uh, of, of that kind. And uh, you go with all the tools you have. So, uh, the, the, for example, I'm very excited now and part of a group of people who are interested in using just what we hear, listening, passive acoustics, you listen to a coral reef, and because a lot of the animals on a coral reef make noise. For example, there are snapping right. shrimp which snap, uh, and there there are uh, croaker fish that croak. Uh, the, there are all kinds of different noises. And now, with artificial intelligence and signal processing that have been developed for other purposes, we can t make tapes of a coral reef and using AI and so forth, figure out who's there. Uh, similarly with genomics now and genetics, we can, we can sieve DNA from seawater and all animals when they swim in seawater release DNA, whether you're a turtle or a fish or a crab. And then we can match that against uh, DNA that's in databases. So there are uh, the traditional ways of scuba diving and uh, using nets and trawls, which are still very valuable. But there are these, I'll say, 21st century methods, like the passive acoustics with artificial intelligence or the genomics, uh, where we can go and learn a lot. And uh, you know, those are at the frontier of science, make, which makes it especially exciting. Well, I'm so curious, what does a coral reef sound like? <laughs> well, it sounds different by day and by night. And it, it sounds uh, uh, different. For example, during a storm, it may become much quieter. Uh, also, if there are noises of predators or of a, a vessel nearby, it may quiet down. But you, you get uh, different animals make sounds at different, different frequencies. So some animals are quite high pitched and some animals have deeper voices, so to say. Whales, for example, the large cetaceans, whales and seals uh, and so forth are famous for you know, having deep voices. And those deep, the low frequencies travel long distances, which is why whales can find each other in the ocean when they're hundreds or even thousands of kilometers apart. Whereas high frequencies don't travel very far. But if you're, if you're just trying to reach, you know, if you're one, one, one shrimp and you're just trying to reach another shrimp that's very nearby that may be that may be fine so you get you'll get a distribution of noises through the frequency spectrum and through the volume spectrum again there are some animals that uh, are, are quite loud another amazing thing is that when the background noise rises as used to happen before covid when you were in a uh, in a restaurant then you speak louder. Right. And that's called the Lombard effect. And animals, some animals do the same thing. So they're, if, if the background is pretty quiet, they, they'll, so to say, be pretty quiet and communicating with one another. But if it gets noisy because of a lot of activity or because a, a jet ski goes by, they'll start shouting. So, so there's, there are all kinds of things you can learn from the, uh, the, the passive acoustics of just listening. That is amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I learned so much about uh, marine life and just, yeah, uh, the environment in general. So thank you so much. Thank you, Karina. Good luck to you. Thank you.